come here to talk about the future of energy and the future of energy in Sri Lanka. Um, first of all, the main point that I want to make is that whether you live in a feudal setup or you live in a democracy, whether you know you have an AI normally running on a server, whether you live in some megapolis or you know in some pastoral wonderland, whatever you do, you're going to need energy and you're definitely going to need more and more of it as a society. I really, in my imaginings, find it very hard to think that we are going to go backwards in terms of how much energy we need as a society or as a country. Um, so in that sense, energy is very much kind of the backbone of everything that we do. And how we design or how we build that backbone is really kind of the basis of how strongly we can stand. So it's a keystone of everything that we're talking about today. I think it connects very well to all the other three speakers as well. Um, so let's get started. So here are three competing visions of the future. The first is the CEB's long-term generation expansion plan that came out this April. Now this plan, or this vision of the future, is very much uh, a look at the future as kind of an extension of today. Here we are now. Here is today's technology. And this is kind of what we can do in terms of tiny incremental improvements to push towards tomorrow. So it relies very heavily on a lot of thermal power. There's a lot of coal power thought about in this plan. Um, and uh, not, in my words, a very forward think, not in my I, uh, imaginings, a very forward thinking plan. Uh, another vision for the future is this uh, document that I found uh, while I was doing the research uh, for this talk which is the ADB's plan to have Sri Lanka be 100% dependent on renewable energy by 2050. Now that's a very well-researched plan. Um, it has a lot of elements uh, that currently exist. It also imagines some things that are possible in the future. But a third vision is, of course, Sir Arthur's vision. And these are parts of his uh, imaginings that he put forward in 2001, where he imagined what the world would be like by 2100. So then very next year after he made this prediction, he said the world's first low temperature fusion reactor is going to come online. He said by 2003, the motor industry is given five years to eliminate completely all petroleum vehicles. The last coal mine on earth would close in 2006. And that the first quantum generator tapping this kind of, I, I, I don't even know what to call it, vacuum energy would come online or be discovered by 2009, that these devices would be small, portable, and that would shut down completely any kind of need for any kind of electrical distribution. So that was Sir Arthur's vision. And I, as an engineer, you know, I would like to believe that that's the future, but my engineering kind of background is kind of keeping me more on the ground. So I kind of tend to agree with that middle vision. So not today as an, ex tomorrow as an extension of today, not some unbelievable future where technology just appears out of nowhere, but rather a kind of a middle path where you have today, you take tomorrow, and what you imagine can be possible, and then you hit some kind of middle ground there in terms of what you actually do and in terms of how you plan for the future. Now, Sir Arthur's vision, and I've, I've been reading science fiction for a long time since I was a very small boy. Um, and his vision of the future has always influenced me a lot in terms of how he saw the society of the future, in terms of how optimistic he was that we would kind of evolve into this kind of global species, uh, very peaceable, um, very sharing. Um, and that vision, I think, is what he has in all his books. And this vision is actually what I believe will happen in the future as well. I'm also an optimist. But I believe it will be powered now, this is a very long-term view. I believe in the very long term, the Earth will be powered by solar satellites beaming down energy from space in the form of microwaves to rectennas on Earth. Right? This is a very long-term view. I also believe that at the same time, we'll develop the technology to create a global power net. Like we have Wi-Fi now, you'll just tap into power at that point in time. 
So the need for batteries, you don't need storage, you just need to be tapped into the power net. And just like some countries are considering internet access almost a human right today, I think the future will consider access to power in any quantity you like at any time you want, almost a right as such. So that's my view for the long-term future. That's what I would really want to see. But as an engineer, I can't go there yet. You know, I'm stuck with what we have today. So this is where we are now, right? As you can see, the picture on the left, the little graph on the left shows the world's current energy mix. So as you can see, the top three are easily by far oil, coal, and natural gas, um, also rising very fast. And at the bottom, you have hydropower, nuclear, and all other renewables. So the world is very, very fossil fuel dependent. Climate change is happening as a result of this. But as you can see, the little green line at the bottom is a little bit of hope. So that's a little bit of renewables increasing year on year. Sri Lanka is not very different. So this uh, donut on the right is Sri Lanka's current energy mix. So we're about 39% biomass. So that's mostly firewood and charcoal. 39% um, petroleum. A lot of that is for transport and also for energy generation. 9% of Sri Lanka's energy comes from large hydro plants, but the potential for large hydro, as you guys already know, has been almost completely tapped. 10% is coal, thanks to the new massive coal power plants that we've built and that the CEB's plan will continue to build in the future. And only about 3% is from all other renewables. So Sri Lanka's energy mix is quite expensive in terms of how much we pay for electricity. Um, it's relatively reliable, especially in terms of our other South Asian neighbors. Sri Lanka's energy network and electricity network are really, really very good. Back. Sorry. And as you can see, with more and more coal being planned, more and more thermal power plants being planned, the situation is becoming increasingly unsustainable. So this is the situation we are in right now. But what do I think is the way forward? But this is, I did these calculations uh, last night and I very crudely drew this out, so it's not perfect. But if you look at Sri Lanka's energy consumption predicted for next year, it's in 2018, we are around 16,000 gigawatt hours. And that little square is the amount of solar panels that you'd need to run the entire country. If you had enough battery storage to store that and release it at the right times, you put solar panels on the square, you don't need anything else. You don't need any thermal power plants, you don't need coal, you don't need anything. You just need that little square of solar panel, and obviously it doesn't have to be one big square. You can distribute it among households, and that's the total area of solar power that you'd need to run the whole country. If consumption increases even dramatically, and, and sorry, if you add transportation onto this, if you add electric cars, you can also put, Sri Lanka has a lot of wind power capacity, and we have a lot of oceans around. There's a lot of ocean power capacity as well. So I think the way to the future is to keep it simple, to invest in renewables and in storage, and to da start divesting from all types of fossil fuel investment. So this is an image from that ADB report that I saw. It's funny because I was looking for, I was trying to build a picture of how to get there, but someone else has already done it. And this is how we'll get to that renewable future by 2050. So the majority of energy in dark green is solar, growing very fast. And in yellow is wind power, also growing fast. Uh, as you can see, all the other forms of energy, uh, coal, oil, combined cycle, gas turbines, everything shuts off uh, the latest by about 2045. So from that point on, Sri Lanka will run a completely renewable energy system, which would be great for our economy, be great for our health, uh, to be great as an example. I mean, we're not going to change global climate change by changing Sri Lanka, whatever we do, but it would be great as an example of what is possible. Um, while I was researching this stuff, I also came up with a lot of people making proposals for nuclear plants in Sri Lanka. And of course, you can ask, why not? Nuclear is, in some ways, a green technology. There are no carbon emissions. Um, but my personal view is let's not do that in Sri Lanka. A lot of issues with construction. Uh, as we know, Sri Lanka doesn't have a great track record of, I, I don't know, we have 
influence, I, let's not even go there. I, I don't think it'll be built very well. Um, and everyone is going off nuclear anyway. A lot of countries are divesting a lot of their nuclear plants and shutting them down. There's a lot of hazardous waste produced in a nuclear plant, in a nuclear fission plant. So we haven't got a nuclear fusion. If we did get a nuclear fusion, obviously I would change my mind about that. And especially since we're so close to developing nuclear fission, fusion, uh, the plants are bound, the first experimental plant is uh, said to come out about 2022. I think it would be a huge mistake to start investing large amounts of money into nuclear plants at this time. So no solar, I mean, sorry, no nuclear. What I propose is a whole mix of strategies and technologies that already mostly exist today and can be improved into the future. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do on the demand side in terms of reducing how much energy we use in what we do. Uh, we can, this is a picture of an LED light bulb. So that's one example of something we can do in our buildings and our homes to reduce energy use. We can obviously go for solar panels. We can do, there's a lot of wind potential in Sri Lanka. And we're surrounded by ocean. And in fact, there's a new technology that's very interesting called OTEC. That's ocean temperature energy conversion. So what you do is you use the temperature difference between the surface of the sea and the bottom of the sea, a thousand meters down to generate power. And those first experiments are slated to happen soon. And Trincomalee Harbor is supposed to be one of the best places in the world to do OTEC. And there's also a lot of wave and tidal potential. Waste to energy is another thing I think is very important. We I mean, it was talked about a lot a little while ago. And of course, to back this up with nuclear fusion, if possible, or flow batteries when they become available. Um, so to run a country entirely on renewable energy, you need to have a lot of storage to store that energy because renewable energy is inherently very variable. Uh, if the sun is covered by a cloud, your solar capacity is cut off, and you need a way to put that energy into the grid when you need it. So storage becomes crucial as you move more and more towards the renewable energy future. And there are many more technologies that I really can't get into detail right now. But overall, access to abundant, reliable, cheap, sustainable energy is what will make Sri Lanka productive, competitive, peaceful, and healthy. So it's a very important uh, question that we all should think about. And in fact, I mean, Sri Lanka's energy system right now, and I've heard someone say this, has always been a minute to midnight. We've always been at the risk of failing, at the risk of uh, suffering catastrophic blackouts. But there have been people, engineers, administrators, people who have held back that clock and kept the lights on. Like uh, DJ Vimla Surendra, who is the father of hydropower in Sri Lanka, who really pushed for that system to be developed. So my future is optimistic. I think we can move towards this more renewable energy future. Um, and I think we can do it with minimum disruption to what, uh, what we're doing now. And I think that it's possible. Thank you.